this week's edition of World Crisis Radio, this is Webster Topley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Right now, it's the middle of the afternoon on Friday, the 17th of August, and it's sunny and warm. It's a very warm day here in this Turkish bath on the banks of the Potomac, and the capital is, of course, uh, if not a darkling plain, maybe a sunny plain swept by confused alarms. Uh, every little thing that happens at the Manafort trial, every little note that comes out of the jury is, of course, uh, an occasion for all the networks to go live to... Uh, to uh, Alexandria, and as I told you, I was uh, I was down there a week ago Thursday to see what this atmosphere was. But we are now in the midst of tremendous intel- uh, intelligence uh, warfare, and what we're dealing with is, first of all, I think the, the baseline is what you're seeing is an expression of the accumulating revulsion of American society as a whole at many levels, many levels. A revulsion is building in this country against Trump and his gang, this regime of grifters, grafters, and incompetents that have somehow gotten control of the government. They have duped sections of the population. They took advantage of the stupidity and the uh, obsessional elitism of the top people in the Democratic Party, right? Their fixation on their politically correct and and Malthusian ideology. But what's building now, and we've always argued this, is the new birth of freedom. And the new birth of freedom is what occurs uh, in the process and in the aftermath of uh, getting rid of this Trump regime. Of course, everything legal and nonviolent, as we always say, and that's going to be advancing by leaps and bounds in the first part of the uh, coming year. Now, let's just take a look. Uh, we are dealing with... Processes. I think the one way we can we can organize these processes is there's a coup. Now, if you watch Hannity or these people, they're talking about coup all the time, right? All the pro-Trump servants of the billionaire class, right? The billionaire class camouflaged with some kind of raving uh, populist rhetoric. But the billionaire class, uh, of course, to be sure, those guys always talk about a coup d'etat. I would say this is, of course, the usual projection. They are taking their um, methods, their intentions, their psychology, and projecting that. In other words, they're accusing you of doing what they are doing. In other words, what they're trying to do is to get rid of the guilt of being sociopathic enemies of society, and therefore they have to say that's really... Uh, you doing it. So, um, to give you a, a case in point here, Governor Cuomo of New York just had this unfortunate gaffe where he was talking about a legitimate topic, right, the U.S. treatment of minorities and related stuff. And uh, he, in the course of this, he happened to say this line, which has now been taken out of context, that uh, uh, America was, has never, was never so good anyway. Now, this is unfortunate, right? This is an this is a elementary political blunder. But then we get these hypocrites coming out. Oh, my God. The, uh, the Republicans, the Trumpers, they come out and say, oh, this is awful. Right, he should resign. This is going to be with him forever. Um, well, uh, remember that Trump, Trump ran for president on the basis of a book, ghost written to be sure, called Crippled America. Crippled America. 
his uh, one of his famous slogans in his campaign was the American dream is dead, said Trump. And remember the lasting line, his first and only inaugural was this zinger about American carnage, American carnage. So when it comes to running down the country, forget about Cuomo. Cuomo is just a, uh, he just uh, blundered. I don't think he really believes that. But for Trump, <clears throat> it was essential to argue crippled America, the dream is dead, and uh, we have American carnage. So you can see what he's doing. The Republicans, after trafficking in anti-American pessimism for so long, as soon as they see even a flicker, they immediately project that. So that's the idea. They are projecting like crazy. And, of course, this is a way for them to ignore what's going on. Now, in terms of the mentality, right, you wonder what the uh, the king, or I'm sorry, you wonder what the emperor is doing tonight. Well, he could be fuming. He could be seething. He could be in what is described as the death spiral. That would mean the kind of um, no-win public relations situation that he got into in the um, – uh, the, the fight with the uh, Kizar Khan uh, family, right, the, uh, with the, their, uh, the war hero son and the Gold Star family and so forth. He gets involved in these things, and uh, very hard to get him out of it. But this now has to be seen in a much bigger context. The leading edge of all this is his attack, Trump's attack on Brennan. Now, we will be told that the attack on Brennan was uh, in the works. It was being planned, but it was not necessarily going to happen this week. It was simply available. It was on the shelf, and it could be then mobilized at any moment of demagogic crisis, right? And, of course, this past week has been a terrible time for the uh, regime. So, it was, uh, as the, the media, to their credit, immediately noted the attack on Brennan, the lifting of his security clearance. That was an attempt to distract public attention from the Omarosa revelations. Now, we, uh, we've had our doubts about Omarosa, but right now, Omarosa has qualified as uh, someone who has performed a valuable public service. And these are people that come along from time to time. In other words, the people that Trump tangles with that then inflict grave damage on him. And it does go back to the Khan family at the Democratic Convention. And then it would include, of course, Stormy uh, and uh, Avenatti, right? Stormy McDaniels and her lawyer, Avenatti. And, and at various times, for a couple of weeks or months here and there, these people come forward, inflict grave damage on Trump, and then the scene or the, the spotlight shifts someplace else. Omarosa this week has done uh, yeoman service, and apparently this for various reasons, right, for reasons of personal cathexis and God knows what, right, we would not comment. Um, this uh, has uh, enraged Trump, again, the fuming, the seething, and so forth, the obsession with this. Uh, I think what one of the things we need is a kind of an index. How many tweets per day and how many tweets per weekend? And the higher this gets, it's like much in the mind of boss tweet. So uh, you have to follow these things, right? Because they are indicative. It's like a weather report. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now, the novelty of this past week was precisely this that Trump, for whatever reason, decided to mobilize this pre-existing measure of depriving former CIA Director Brennan, depriving him of his security clearance. Now, normally, 
You get deprived of a security clearance if you go bankrupt personally, if you become an alcoholic, if you have a drug conviction, also if you have a chaotic personal life, right, if you're um, accused of uh, spousal battery or uh, physical abuse, if you're a wife beater, uh, there are all kinds of symptoms in personal life that make you vulnerable, blackmailable, compromised, as General Flynn was, uh, and then you can be deprived also, of course, if you share uh, secrets. Right? Now, remember, Trump is uh, guilty of sharing these secrets uh, not once but twice, is my counting, and I'm sure more times. Remember, when, when he first got his CIA briefings on this program, we talked about blurt gate. Blurt gate is that the shriveled and diseased ego of this character requires him to uh, try to boast and to strut and posture in the presence of others to whom he feels inferior or by whom he feels threatened, whatever it is. And you remember that one of them, of course, is that he told Lavrov and Kislyak some Israeli uh, secrets from the Middle East. There, There's a couple more. There's where... Uh, Trump went out and talked about the internal secrets of the British government of Theresa May in a live anti-terror action. So this is, of course, very, very reprehensible. So he has done that now. There's no evidence that anything uh, of that nature happened with with Brennan, unless unless you want to include the famous tweet after Helsinki, right, in the first 24 hours, when it was essentially a a need of the United States. It was a need of the country to have somebody come out and say, this is treason. And that was Brennan. So uh, Brennan has earned, uh, I think, undying uh, gratitude of the nation for what he did, that this uh, exceeds, it meets and exceeds, Trump's conduct meets and exceeds the uh, definition of high crimes and misdemeanors. It is nothing short of treasonous and so forth. So, that's the uh, the actual issue. Maybe that's maybe Trump could argue that's a state secret. It's meaning it's true, and uh, I'm not going to let you get away with that, right? You've divulged the state state secret about me, about the fact that I'm an appeaser. Trump would have to say. So that's Brennan deprived of his security clearance. Now you'll also remember. Brennan is, in some ways, I think the more you know about it, the more you'd say the uh, Russian investigation does not start with Christopher Steele and the dossier. That comes in. It's a factor, right? It's, it's a piece of evidence. Of course, you have to evaluate it, but it's not something you just burn or ignore. <laughs> but rather with Brennan, we've, we've stressed this before. As soon as Trump came down the... The escalate reports began to come in from places around the world, different countries, saying, gosh, we've got these Trump representatives here, and we're seeing them getting into bed with the local uh, Russians, with the Russian intelligence people or other Russian representatives and so forth. And we have recited this list for you. I hope if you're a real listener to this program, you know the list. The countries that officially warned the United States, not in public, but behind the scenes, the countries that officially warned the United States included Australia. This has become known, right, the Australian High Commissioner in London having that drunken conversation with Papadopoulos, and uh, he had been told by Mifsud that uh, the Russians had dirt on Hillary, the Maltese Professor Mifsud. So, Britain, uh, Australia, then Britain, this is where the head of GCHQ, Cheltenham, the equivalent of the National Security Agency, flew over and I guess talked to Brennan himself about this uh, at a certain point. So, that's two. So, we've got Australia, we've got the British. Then we have the Dutch, and you'll remember they were the ones who were able to get their hands on the security cameras inside some of the GRU buildings in Moscow. They could see who was coming in and out, and they were able to identify a couple of them. And so that's uh, the third. Then we have France. We have Germany. We have Poland. 
and we have Estonia. Those seven. And this all comes from an article in the London Guardian around the middle of April of uh, this past, well, 2017. So this has been known for quite a while. And that stuff all went into the hands of Brennan. And from Brennan's uh, Senate testimony, I think we can conclude that he was the one who took those warnings to Comey and said, here, you have to start investigating this. So maybe this is why Trump uh, hates him so much and that he's outspoken. But now, we are told that Trump is growing obsessed. He's fascinated by the capabilities of uh, stripping more security clearances, right? Security clearance stripping. He has been uh, threatening this, but now uh, we are told this is now, uh, let's see, the Washington Post, Nakamura and Dawsey coming out this morning, that, um, that Trump is now uh, in the manic phase. He's eager to uh, attack more, more um, people by stripping their security clearances. Of course, if you have a job and you don't have a security clearance, you're likely to lose it. If the security clearance is necessary for the employment that you have, if you're retired or no longer working there, your meal ticket sometimes involves the security clearance. So it is um, something of significance that way. But you also have to figure somebody like Brennan has got his own personal network, and he's going to get a lot of stuff from his uh, former fellow chiefs or other friends. I mean, people like Steele, precisely. Um, so... The danger now is that uh, Trump is on a tear. He's obsessive. He's in the manic phase, and he wants to strip every security clearance in sight from anybody who has ever breathed a breath of les majesté, an offense to the great majesty of the emperor, the emperor Trump, in <laughs> somewhere in the heart of darkness here on the Potomac. Now, uh, as Trump was leaving for his latest junket, another golf tour, no doubt, was leaving today, he told the press he suspects that he will lift the security clearance of the infamous Bruce Orr of the Justice Department uh, any time now. That's coming soon. And we'll be back soon here with the uh, next part, next installment of uh, our program of today. See you in a minute. Back to World Crisis Radio. Now, the, um, the issue raised by this is, of course, Bruce Orr, an official, his wife Nellie, who had actually worked at uh, Fusion GPS, which is a, a research company that goes in many directions. It happened to go in the steel direction, right, appealing to steel. But there's somehow an idea that if you're anti-Trump, that's some kind of original sin. Well, dear... White House and dear Republican thugs, the anti-Trump was the majority on Election Day, and it is now more so the majority. So you, Republicans and Trumpers, you are an unpopular minority. You stink. You're not socially presentable. You are vile. Base, yeah, base and vile. Um, the base is vile, and so forth. So, uh, this is, and we're, what we're talking about here is the, the 20 percent or so of hardcore ones, right? We're, we know that when Nixon left the White House, in spite of all of his crimes, he still had about what 20 to 25 percent, yeah, in uh, August of 1974, 44 years ago, right now. So we're, you know, it's obviously um, Bruce Orr is is uh, on the chopping block. Right now, he doesn't really have an important job. He's just a member of the senior executive service. He is employed by the Department of Justice, and uh, Trump wants to get him, which also I think it shows how foolish he is, whereas Brennan, Brennan had a lot of enemies. Brennan was a sharp infighter. Uh, lots of uh, characters have resentments against Brennan. So, therefore, you see the Republican senators were asked, so what do you think about Trump moving on Brennan, and Brennan's answer, uh, well, his, his answer, he, he then came back with, um, 
this is uh, an attack on um, freedom of speech. And, of course, he also then did his New York Times op-ed saying, Trump is claiming that there was no con- collusion. Trump's claims are hogwash, hogwash, says Brennan. And Brennan is going to be uh, all over the TV now for several days, and Trump is going to pay a tremendous price for this in terms of public uh, relations, but uh, he maybe he's just happy that he was able to get off the hook with Omar Rosa for another day or two. But this this is the level of government. U.S. government should be planning 10, 20 years ahead. <laughs> Not this one. This is one that tries to tries to get through every day on the basis of some new demagogic ploy. This is a pathetic excuse, a wretched, miserable excuse for a government, for the American people. This this guy just has to go. This is intolerable. So who did we have? Republican senators uh, were asked, what do you think about Brennan? And then we have this this idiot, this this jerk, uh, Senator Kennedy, <laughs> not, no relation, from Louisiana saying that he thought Brennan was butthead. Well, inside the intelligence community, Brennan is credited as the guy who, uh, they, according to their claim, tracked down bin Laden. All right, so his prestige among the spooks is great. And uh, you really wonder what these guys think they're doing. Uh, an- another one, of course, Lindsey Graham, the typical liberal Republican snake we've warned you about. He's also very critical of Brennan, no problem. The one who did speak up was Corker of Tennessee, who's on his way out, saying that this kind of stuff is typical of a banana republic. And indeed, when when it happened, we had a number of these people talking about how uh, dangerous it is. Um, Former CIA Deputy Director and Acting Director McLaughlin on TV saying these are authoritarian tactics. This is the way authoritarians act against their critics. And then Deputy NSC Director Ben Rhodes, uh, and again, we are critical of him, uh, saying that this is an autocratic uh, country if, if you let this sort of stuff go through. Now, here's the big thing. Now that Trump has become obsessed with stripping security clearances, right, in much the same way that he was obsessed with pardons, there was a while... Pardons was the big issue. Now, of course, like the seven- or eight-year-old child that he is inside, his attention has wandered away from the um, question of of pardons, at least for the moment, uh, and it is now fixated on these uh, security-stripping things. Now, the main danger was usefully pointed out by Senator Warner of Virginia, Gold is where you find it. So a right-wing Democrat, that's fine, but he is the ranking member on the Senate Intelligence Committee. The Senate is in play. He could become the chairman. That would be a step up. We have people all over the place. They're saying, oh, the Senate Intelligence Committee. I have so much respect for uh, Congressman Burr. Who? Aaron Burr? No, Senator Burr of, uh, of North Carolina. They've been doing such a wonderful job. What the hell have they done? What have they revealed? What do we know? Thanks to them. Nothing, as far as I can see. Um, So Warner, and this was the point, Warner comes out and say, well, to say, if if Trump is going to do this, Trump could now prepare to attack Mueller, and I think he means uh, uh, the rest of Mueller's uh, team, Right, So all of those 15 or 20 lawyers on the Mueller team, they need security clearances too. And Trump may figure out that he can strip them of their security clearances. This would not be seen by some ignorant public opinion as firing them, although it would, in effect, paralyze the uh, the investigation. Right? So Mueller and company security stripped. And the more that these people in the Justice Department, like Bruce Orr, get attacked, the more dangerous it is. Now, the list, we have the list of proscriptions. Uh, 
In the civil war in Rome, after the assassination of Julius Caesar, we have the members of the second triumvirate, and above all, Mark Antony and Octavian, the future Augustus Caesar, and M. Aemilius Lepidus, the weak sister of the three. But they would sit down and do the proscriptions. There's a great scene in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar where the guy says, I'm putting a dot by his name, and that means he will die. Uh, proscribing. So here we know we get the proscriptions from Trump. Remember, Trump is attempting to get, he wants, uh, <laughs> he wants Sessions, known here as Secessions, Jefferson Beauregard Secessions has received his order to arrest Omarosa. Arrest her. Whoa. That's a symptom of a coup. And this is going to be one of our themes here in the rest of the uh, program. But here's the list that was read out. This is the preliminary enemies list or proscription list read out by Madame Huxterby at the White House press briefing. Uh, Clapper, the former director of uh, national intelligence. Comey, the former head of the FBI. Hayden, former head of the NSA and CIA and a four-star general in the Pentagon. Sally Yates, former acting attorney general who defied Trump. That little lady has won the uh, hearts of a nation. Susan Rice from the uh, Obama National Security Council, previously the U.S. Uh, ambassador to the U.N. McCabe, uh, he's up there now with Lois Lerner and the villains of our time. Struck and Page, right, the ones that Trump calls the lovebirds, and Bruce Orr. So it's a list of about ten. Those are the ones Trump says he will target. They target, but the main danger is Mueller and Mueller's team. And that's the coup. Now we've got to talk about a coup. See you in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So we are looking at the intelligence warfare. Now, we got to do a kind of a little methodological premise here. We're talking coup d'etat. Now, what you see in Washington right now, I think this is the only way to see it, is a coup by the pro-Trump forces. In the United States, inevitably, right, because these institutions are so old and prestigious in many ways uh, and um, well-rooted, uh, it's hard to simply go outside of... Uh, of legality. In other words, the the typical sort of Latin American coup, uh, the tanks surround the presidential palace, the Air Force bombs the presidential palace, like Allende in Chile in um, 1973. You're going to have um, other tanks take over the telephone exchange, uh, and you can see how, how uh, quaint some of this stuff is. That's the Latin coup, right? Pronunciamento. But now what we're talking about is something much more subtle, right? The modern coup, 21st century coup in an advanced country, uh, assisted by foreign powers, right? If, a, if an unpopular minority, like the Republicans and the Trumpers, want to consolidate power and essentially head off an election, vanify an election, they have to do this carefully. In other words, they've got to do it under color of law. Now, some would say, well, uh, Hitler uh, did it under color of law. He did largely, but not completely, because, of course, in order to get himself voted dictatorial powers, he had to, he had to expel all the communists, the entire KPD, which was, uh, I guess, the third largest party, or fourth, kick them out of the uh, Reichstag, the, the parliament there. So you have to realize that, that some of this stuff about the color of law is, um, is relative, right? It, it's, and a lot depends on appearances. Now, what kind of coup can you have? Uh, you can have um, a cold coup. A cold coup would be uh, at the level of institutions. Um, you... 
get control, you pack pack it in and uh, pack the various uh, commanding heights of the state with your uh, backers, right, your stooges, and you have carried out a cold coup. And it, this is something that would happen, you know, on a Friday afternoon in August, right? Nobody would necessarily notice. There's then the creeping coup. Some of this stuff come, it often comes from Italian or Spanish, especially. The creeping coup, golpe strisciante. That's a mixture, right? That's Spanish golpe and Italian strisciante for creeping. Golpe strisciante is a coup that moves slowly over weeks, months, maybe even more, maybe years, by taking over these commanding heights of the state. Um, and you've got uh, Otto Golpe. This was uh, this is Spanish. This was President Fujimori of Peru, who was already president. He was uh, he was a legal president, and he wanted to make himself into a dictator. So that's an Otto Golpe. We got to think about that as being maybe something connected to our. Uh, situation. And when you look at this, you're trying to do an inventory in, in the old Latin American coup, you'd be counting how many divisions of the army support the government, how many divisions of the army support the rebels. And then you'd be doing where do the norm, the military services come down? I remember being in Peru. I was able, I was briefing the, um, the Army General Staff, the Navy General Staff, and the Air Force. And um, you could tell by the way they commented that they had, they had different points of view. In other words, they were not on the same line. And sometimes that gets to a coup where two services or one service support the coup and the others don't. And sometimes they fight. So that goes on. Now, in the United States today, I don't think so. But you do want to have an idea of what forces are leaning in which directions, right? So, the, again, I think we actually have a fairly encouraging result uh, with the people that are coming out to oppose Trump at this juncture because, as I say, the people who had had any experience in the state, people who understood statecraft, the needs of the state, the government, the nation, State maybe in the European sense, right? McLaughlin says this is an authoritarian move. Ben Rhodes says this is for autocrats. Of course, um, the first one was uh, Brennan to say this is treason. So a coup backed up by a foreign power, that's another one. There's also where you arrange to lose a war so the foreign power can come in and put you, an unpopular minority, into power. That's harder to do here in the U.S., but that was... Marshal Pétain and Vichy France. They, the French generals were pro-fascist, pro-Nazi. They essentially let the German forces in, and with that they could then create the government that they want, which was the Vichy regime of Marshal Pétain. Don't forget Marshal Pétain in all of this, right? Job, country, and family. That's his uh, traditionalism, right? Long before long before Bannon or these other people came along. Now, the first thing we have in the last uh, day or so is, I believe we're up to 15 in top intelligence honchos who are opposing Trump on this, and they have a statement that talks about freedom of speech. I guess these are people who always act behind screens, right? I don't think the issue is freedom of speech. I think the issue is, is there going to be a coup? Uh, in the sense that the uh, the uh, Republicans seem to want it. So who is who is doing the show of force? Now, pay attention to these names. Uh, Judge William Webster, head of the FBI, head of the CIA, back under uh, Bush the Elder. Then we had George Tenet, was uh, from 97 to 2004. So coming out of Clinton and into Bush the Younger, head of the CIA. Porter Goss, appointed by Bush the Younger, 2005 to 2006. Michael Hayden, we've said him before, CIA director, 2006 to 2009. Also NSA director, four-star Pentagon. 
Uh, Leon Panetta, former CIA director, 09 to 11. He was also Secretary of Defense. He was also White House Chief of Staff. You notice these are different, right? You've got Republicans, Democrats. Then we have General David Petraeus, four-star general, and the uh, CIA director from 2011 to 2012. Then another heavyweight, Robert Gates, CIA director, a creature of Bush the Elder, put in there by Bush the Elder, part of the Bush the Elder's CIA faction, who then became... Secretary of Defense, and he stretched his tenure from Bush the Younger into Obama. Then we have James Clapper, was the Director of National Intelligence from 20, let's see, 2010 to 2017, um, meaning that um, he had been the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, I think. He's a general. He's a four-star general. John E. McLaughlin, uh, former CIA deputy director. I think for a while he was acting director. And then some of these others are made a little bit less known. Stephen R. Kappas, former de- deputy director from 06 to 10. Uh, Michael Morell was the acting head of the CIA, uh, deputy director from 2010 to 2013. And then Avril, Avril Haynes former deputy director, 2013 to 2015. And the last one is David S. Cohen, deputy director of the CIA from 15 to 17. So that's 15 heavy-duty intelligence committee people. Now, we'll tell you, we'd like to point out who's not on the list when we come back here in our next hour. Second hour of a World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. And remember, you've got to follow this fast-moving analysis. We are normally a couple of weeks or a couple of months ahead of the normal uh, news, right? We're often a very significant uh, anticipation ahead of them. So, um Yes, the, the danger is now, we're told that, uh, that Trump is being incited to have Omar Rosa arrested. Uh, she was always described as someone who could trigger Trump. Now, Omar Rosa has been boasting that uh, she can take Trump on. And, of course, this is uh, the way you have to do it, right? You can see this from Avenatti and from Stormy and so forth uh, on, uh, let's see, MSNBC, Craig Melvin, the other day, um, Omar Rosa threw down the gauntlet to Trump, saying, hey, Trump, my tapes are better. This is, it, it, this is an amazing event, right? Uh, the Republican National Committee paid money to splice together a whole bunch of uh, panegyrics, right, a bunch of adulation in comia uh, by Omarosa for Don, right? She didn't have the one about bowing down to Don as the master of the universe, but that was all in that direction. But now Omarosa says, the tapes I still have are better. My tapes are better. She's estimated to have 200 tapes. So that is the stuff of which nightmares are made for the perception mongers of this White House. And, of course, boss tweet. Um, Omar Ross's line is, Trump has met his match. That kind of language was what we also heard during the heyday of Avenatti and Stormy. And uh, this is all going to build up. Uh, the comeback for this, of course, was from, I think, Colbert <clears throat> last night. When uh, <coughs> when Omarosa says, my tapes are better than your tapes, Colbert's comment was, uh, I bet Russia's got you both beat. So let's uh, bring it on, right? Bring on those Russian tapes, too. It's about time. Of course, once they, they use them, then they lose them. 
Therefore, um, the fighting is going on. Now, the, the joke was, uh, and maybe not a joke, we're told that Sam Nunberg, remember him? The great friend of, uh, or former friend, or I can't follow these people, right, because they quarrel uh, so much, right? It's all um, musical chairs. Nunberg, I think the former supporter of Roger Stone, Nunberg has told different cable TV stations that General Kelly in the White House is the one who's hyping Trump, saying, you've got to do something about this Omarosa. We have to shut her up, maybe lock her up. Kelly is inciting Trump to have Omarosa jailed, and that the, the guy who's got to do that is Sessions. So uh, the bottom line, years of chaos in a single day. Now, again, we're looking at the array of forces. Probably the first thing we should say is that about 400 newspapers this week, uh, largely on the same day, right, largely on, uh, I guess it must have been Thursday, these newspapers all across the U.S., um, the Boston Globe started it. Uh, the texts were not the same. Every paper wrote its own editorial, but the general idea was defend the First Amendment, defend, defend free speech. And for a lot of them, that's a great chance to uh, attack uh, Trump. So there are pages and pages of this. You can go to the Washington, uh, the uh, Boston Globe website, and they will uh, lead you to the rest of them. Uh, journalists are not uh, the enemy. So again, I regard that as civil society, right? That many newspapers. We remember during the election, it was something like 70 or 80 newspapers supported Mrs. Clinton, and I think two supported Trump. And it was, if you could read and write, you were not going to be very much in the Trump uh, column. But now, 400 who say it's time to defend the First Amendment and stop this, uh, this incitement, right, this demonization of reporters. That I regard as something big, right, because it means if you have the whole civil society against you and they're kind of organized in this way, um, that's significant. The other thing, of course, Fox News is still uh, supporting Trump, but you realize Fox News appears as the biggest because the others are split up, right? MSNBC and CNN compete for the same audience. If you only had one non-reactionary, I guess we can call them, um, they might be bigger than, than Fox, right? It depends. And, of course, they compete with PBS and, uh, and all the rest. Now, we've got to look at this uh, in terms of the forces before we go into some of the, uh, the measures. Uh, on August 6th, a guy... Uh, tweeted at General Barry McCaffrey, four-star general, former uh, drug czar, I guess under Clinton. The guy asks him, Dear General McCaffrey, whose side will the military be on if POTUS attempts a soft or hard coup? And McCaffrey writes back, This is dangerous talk. There will be no such thing. We are ultimately protected by the Constitution. We have strong institutions of government. We have a strong judicial system. Congress holds ultimate political power. We have an aggressive media. We have the vote. Now, of course, I agree with all that. And I think, again, the U.S. institutions are some of the oldest and most uh, tested. We probably do have the strongest civil society in the world, as you see with the 400 newspapers essentially repudiating Trump. Let's just take, let's go back to our list of 12 uh, intelligence uh, bosses. William Webster is a Reagan appointee. Tenet is a Clinton appointee. Goss is a Bush the Younger appointee. Hayden is Bush the Younger. Panetta is Obama. Petraeus is Obama. Uh, Gates is, uh, he, I, I guess he, he comes from, uh, 
the, the Bush administration, right? He's certainly a creature of the Bush family. There was no doubt about that. And then some of the others, right? So you've got all of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven former heads of the CIA. If you add the ones that were acting, I think you get up to nine former heads of the CIA. Now also notice, uh, Hayden is the Air Force. Clapper is the Air Force. A lot of the other ones are internal, Gates, Secretary of Defense, Panetta, Secretary of Defense. And as you got to look at these institutions, if Trump decides to go wild, a lot of it will have to do with the House of Representatives, but a lot of it will have to do with these institutions and the attitudes they assume. Now, that leads us to the next one. Uh, let's bring on, for this purpose, Edgar Allan Poe and his famous poem, Once Upon a Midnight Dreary, While Trump Pondered Weak and Weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten law. While Trump nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at Trump's chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," Trump muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. And then he gets to the point of saying, "'Tell me, Raven, tell me, can I become dictator?' And the answer is, quoth McRaven, nevermore. Quoth McRaven, nevermore. And we'll be back to explain that cryptic stuff in just a minute on World Crisis Media. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So, the McRaven, of course, in The Raven, but this is McRaven. He is the retired Admiral McRaven, um, credited by many with the, um, the actual on-the-ground direction of the final phase uh, back in, what, 2012 on um, 2013 on uh, Osama bin Laden. Must have been 2012. So McRaven, here we have the Washington Post. This is an editorial written in large type. So here we have Navy retired Vice Admiral William H. McRaven on Capitol Hill. And uh, the headline, Take My Security Clearance too, Mr. President. Uh, Dear Mr. President, former CIA Director John Brennan, whose security clearance you revoked on Wednesday, is one of the finest public servants I have ever known. Few Americans have ever done more to protect this country than John. He's a man of unparalleled integrity whose honesty and character have never been in question except by those who don't know him. So this is the idea. This is the team, right? Brennan on the intelligence side and this guy, McRaven, the Navy SEAL, doing the actual attack. So this adds up to what the existing institutions regard as the uh, Osama bin Laden uh, attack. So he says, I had hoped that uh, you would uh, get serious as to rise to the occasion and become a leader, that uh, the leader that we needed. However, your leadership has shown little of these qualities. Through your actions, you have embarrassed us in the eyes of our children, humiliated us on the world stage, and worst of all, divided us as a nation, if you think for a moment that your McCarthy-era tactics will suppress the voices of criticism, you are sadly mistaken. The criticism will continue until you shape up. Uh, and again, that's, I think, a rhetorical flourish, not likely to occur. That's McRaven. Now, you look at all this, right? McRaven, uh, apparently, you know, very prestigious among the actual uh, the war fighting types. Uh, if we go back to that list of the 12, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, for example, pointed out that Robert Gates is probably the quietest of these people. He's least involved in grandstanding. He's not a paid consultant on any cable network. Panetta, for example, is. 
Brennan now is. Brennan's going to move, going to visit MSNBC, uh, later today before you, uh, you hear this. Uh, and again, look, look at William Webster, FBI boss and CIA boss. Um, so we're not, we're not, by the way, we're not assembling a, um, a, a storybook of the saints. We're simply saying this represents institutional power. And what you also see then is the two Air Force guys, um, that would be Hayden and Clapper, the Navy guy, McRaven. Now, this is an interesting one. In a discussion on, uh, on McRaven, this was CNN. CNN often brings in a commentator, General Mark Hurtling. So this is an Army guy, right? Army. It was a division commander in Europe, and then he was more. Uh, so it's a discussion about McRaven. So they, they say, well, General Mark Hurtling, what do you think about that? And he says, actually, put me on the list, too. I want to join that same call. I want to be uh, part of that uh, protest. And the idea is do something for honor. We need to talk some length about honor. I don't know if we can do it all today, but honor for a military officer, and really for anybody serious, honor is the thing you can't live without. Life is not worth very much if there's no honor. So that's when McRaven says, I would consider it an honor if you would revoke my security clearance as well so I can add my name to the list of men and women who have spoken up against your presidency. So get the idea? This is the time to stand up and be counted. And I think that is actually correct. In other words, these are the times that try men's souls, the sunshine patriot and the summer soldier uh, are gaping at Fox News and listening to Limbaugh and so forth, but now's the time for actual uh, patriots to come forward. And the perspective is, is certainly, um, certainly there, um, which would mean, for example, the polling now for the, sum, for the uh, November election, that's where we're going, and then we'll get into the, the, the coup and the, and the counter coup. We have polling now. This is from Nate Silver. Now, some people would say, oh, weren't you wrong before? No, they weren't that wrong. They're not able, the problem with their polling methods is they can't quite account for the vagaries of the electoral college. But um, I think the, the word from Silver is that it's about 70 seats are in play. 70 seats in the House. And I want to keep stressing my view that the Senate is much more threatened than the Republicans think. Some of those states may have been won by Trump. You look at the Tammy uh, Baldwin in Wisconsin, I believe. Look, uh, that place was won by, what, 20, 30, 40,000 votes? There were three states won by 77,000 votes, so forget them. And we know that Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the upper Midwest, the revulsion against Trump is overwhelming. Anybody who wants to be a respectable, petty bourgeois, above all, you want to be a respectable, petty bourgeois woman, you've got to turn away from Trump. The states are what they are. On the other hand, they're not... Uh, gerrymandered, right? Those states are what they are. The House is gerrymandered. The Republicans are going to lose the House. And this, of course, then becomes this uh, nightmare scenario for Trump. We've had articles written about all the oversight that could be done, right? House committees with ambitious chairs come on in and um, Trump does something. Suppose he strips Brennan's security clearance. Hearings on that start the next day. And uh, you get the idea. Every time he turns around, every stupid tweet can become the subject of hearings until the life will go out of the booze for Don, to coin a phrase. And we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. 
Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now, of course, we had mentioned in passing that the uh, enemies list, right, the proscriptions, uh, this is a uh, something that goes back to the civil wars in Rome. It goes back to, again, Mark Antony, the future Caesar Augustus, and the weak Emilius Lepidus, uh, planning to get rid of their enemies after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Um, in our recent U.S. history, it uh, goes back to August 1971. What, 47 years ago, right now, this month, August 1971. John Dean, who was on TV talking about it, although you heard it first on my other radio show, uh, Dean prepared a rationale for an enemies list. He did this at the request of Chief of Staff Haldeman and domestic policy czar Ehrlichman. It was uh, the work of key staff members uh, Chuck Colson, the Holy Roller, Dent, Buchanan, still with us, unfortunately. Um, in some ways, the pilot project for Trump is Buchanan and his friend Sam Francis. The uh, question was, how to use the available federal machinery to screw our political enemies? Now, we have to assume that with Trump, it's something more targeted. It's something more systematic. It means to uh, assert power, the autogolpe side of things, right, the self-coup. Uh, they were targeting rival candidates, Edmund Muskie, Democrat of Maine, Mayor Lindsay of New York, Daniel Shore of CBS, Paul Newman, the actor, Maxwell Dane of uh, Madison Avenue, Doyle Dane Burnback. They also targeted leading universities. Well, Ted Kennedy, Muskie, Mondale, leading universities and foundations, National Education Association. For some reason, they targeted the National Cleaning Contractors Association. Also featured on the list, the then quarterback for the New York Jets professional football team, Broadway Joe Namath. And, uh, of course, people who got on this list considered this a badge of honor. That's what we're hearing here from Admiral McRaven. So this is part of the downfall of Nixon. It is the paranoia uh, of Nixon. In this case, I think, though, it's more of a uh, an actual strategy. Now, let's just go through the actions on two sides. Once again, we're talking a creeping coup. Uh, we've talked about this before. It is the permanent austerity dictatorship. It depends, at least initially, on having the presidency, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. It depends on destroying mass organizations that could mount resistance. That would be labor unions, but it would also include then the resistance. In other words, people today, be it the Women's March or other organizations, uh, teachers' unions, Remember, they've been on the march in North Carolina, in Kentucky, Arizona, Oklahoma, Colorado, West Virginia, new labor militancy, again, unions. Um, so all of these mass organizations, the whole realm of civil society, including then, as we heard, institutions, right, universities, newspapers. We've just heard from 400 of them. So that's um, the creeping coup is to try to knock those off one by one. So we look. We seem to be seeing a combination creeping coup, golpe strisciante, and an auto golpe in the Fujimori tradition, where you're already president, but you want to make yourself president and then some. In other words, a a kind of uh, dictator. Now here's what we got. Let's just look at some of the most recent ones in this dramatic phase. First of all, we have Brennan stripped of his uh, security clearance, big affront to the intelligence community, and main danger, as Senator Warner says, the danger is that, that uh, Don will then go on to strip Mueller and Andrew Weisberg and the others, right, the people that were in the um, Alexandria and these other uh, investigations. Then 
Rudy Giuliani this week made some of the most explicit threats that he's made against uh, Mueller. He says if Mueller uh, is going to write a report, he should write his damn report and give it to us. And if he, he doesn't do that in two or three weeks, we will come down on Mueller like a ton of bricks. Hmm. Okay. Kavanaugh. Part, the key part of this thing is to pack the Supreme Court with fascist judges. So in the case of Kavanaugh, we've got this, this whole operation with Senator Gastly of Iowa saying we're going to limit the docks. We're going to have a, uh, a gatekeeper screen the docks. This is where leaks are really needed, right? Some real uh, light on the life of this guy, Kavanaugh. He is a theoretician of dictatorship. I was amazed to see Gary Johnson, oh, the libertarian yesterday, Gary Johnson on TV, uh, that he wants to run for governor of, uh, no, senator from Arizona, I guess it is. No, New Mexico, sorry. New Mexico. So Gary uh, Johnson is then asked, well, what do you think of Kavanaugh? Would you vote for him? Yes. So the libertarian is willing to vote for an out-and-out theoretician of dictatorship, right? A follower of the unitary executive who wants the government interfering in the lives of women. Can you imagine what kind of police state it would take to enforce a ban on abortions? The kind of intrusion that would be needed? That's a one-way ticket to a police state. No, no, no. For all kinds of reasons, but these are the reasons that ought to be uh, considered also. So, Kavanaugh, it's going to be, uh, Gasly is saying, oh, we're going to have all these, uh, these um, documents. Feinstein in that committee, the ranking member, puts up some resistance, but she's just, we can't expect her to become a firebrand passionaria here in what will likely be her, you know, her next to the last term. We hope she's going to get reelected. But um, firebrand Passionaria, she is not. But she's doing something. We've got to have outside forces come in with uh, the real lowdown on Cav, Kavanaugh. Because this guy, this is totalitarianism on the march. So then um, what else do we have? In West Virginia... The Republican state legislature is in the process of driving out, purging the entire Supreme Court of the state. And they say, well, it's because of corruption. It's because of overspending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is simply a kind of um, it's kind of a, a pilot project. You got to remember Hitler's coup d'etat of January 1933 was preceded by the coup d'etat of the fascists in Prussia, the largest component of Germany. Now, this is not West Virginia. The analog would be California. It's not not comparable in that sense, but it is in the sense of a smaller uh, pilot project. The coup d'etat in Prussia, under the auspices of von Papen, the uh, monocled aristocrat, who was at that time the uh, the prime minister. So remember, it's Brüning, von Papen, Schleicher, and Hitler. Those are the last chancellors of the Weimar Republic. So here we are in July 1932. It's von Papen, and they put Prussia into receivership and impose a uh, Nazi regime, and that's the immediate pleasure institutional to the uh, coup sent by uh, Hitler, the Macht der Typhoon of January 1933. So here they're doing it, they're doing something similar in West Virginia. They're saying we're going to purge the court and we're going to stack it with all the uh, lunatic reactionary stages. Back to the minute. Back to World Crisis Radio, our, already our last segment, but let's try to complete this outline of the creeping coup, and then we've got important, once again, counter-coup elements. So coup elements, Brennan, stripped of security, the threat to strip the other ten, it's an important component, but most of all, the attempt to strip Mueller, Weisberg, Osonye, and the rest, strip them of their security clearances. And I think this idea may have germinated in the sick mind of uh, Trump. Because this is, what, this is more or less what Warner 
uh, warns of in his own language. Um, West Virginia, the essentially the purge of the entire state Supreme Court. I can't go into the details. Rudy Giuliani threatening to come down on Mueller like a ton of bricks. Kavanaugh being rammed through. September 4th. This has to be stopped. He's got to be borked. Well, we have to figure it's, what is it, two or three weeks now. This is absolutely crazy. Then, there was a straw in the wind this week, but I, I want to just mention it so people are alerted. The notion of a constitutional convention or convention of the states has been hanging over this country like a sword of Damocles for some years. Remember, the idea was revived by Nelson Rockefeller, plutocrat, when he was governor of New York. But now it has been the war horse of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, thought to be a uh, part of the Koch brothers' orbit. Um, They say that they are now down to a point where only seven states are needed to convoke the convention. This is not something that can be done under short, uh, on short order, unless you have some situation like West Virginia, where you can uh, essentially uh, rubber stamp just about anything, right? Because you've got, if the Trumpers take over, they're paranoid, they're crazed, they're fanatics, and they'll do just about anything. Then the Washington Post, I believe, has posted online today an emergency call to defend voting rights in North Carolina. We know this has been going on. The Republicans in North Carolina, it's the old Jesse Helms machine, you bet you. They are scheming to strip the black population, but also Latinos, students, old people, um, poor people, strip them of the right to vote. And uh, Washington Post regards that as an emergency. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that would be included in this sort of creeping coup. Now, what's on the other side? The most interesting thing, uh, I would say, is no parade. Trump had wanted to have a military parade. Were they going to goose step? They'd have to learn to goose step? I don't know whether they'll be goose stepping, but it won't be November 11th. In other words, Trump, uh, obviously, seeing only the husk of the... Republique Gaulienne, General de Gaulle's Fifth French Republic, which is uh, still there and thriving. He was so impressed by Macron and all those tanks on the Champs-Élysées back on July 14th that he wants, he wants to do it himself. Well, the military services have somehow, in their own inimitable way, said, no, too expensive, not Three or four million dollars, but 92 million, 100 million dollars out of this world can't do it. Now, I look at that and I say that is reassuring because the thing we want is the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, other ancillary services, the entire intelligence community. But in this case, it's the military services, especially the Army, saying no. <laughs> No, um, we don't want to become a vehicle, because this would, of course, be a great, it would be, uh, would they do it on the 11th? Would they do it before the election? I think they'd try to move it to before the election. Do it a week early. That must have been what Trump was going for. Anyway, I'm guessing. But no military parade. Not only no military parade, but what we've just heard, Admiral McRaven, quoth McRaven, never more concerning Trump's dictatorial ambitions. And then, of course, as we've gone through, the 15 intelligence community veterans, but bosses, uh, again, it's it's uh, most of them going way back. Who's not on this list? Well, the most obvious who's not on the list, former director of the CIA, hey, George H.W. Bush. Hey, George H.W. Bush, sign this now. Sign it. Uh, He's still around. He could easily sign it. That would give it a real, um, well, uh, wonderful uh, burnishing of these credentials. Um, James Woolsey, he's a sort of a dubious character these days. Remember, he was meeting with the Turks about kidnapping Gulen. Uh, John Deutsch, I think he still works at MIT. Why doesn't he sign it? Deutsch, come and sign it. 
Uh, the other ones, and here's the list in order, Kenneth, Goss, Hayden, Panetta, Petraeus, Brennan. Then, of course, there's Mike Pompeo. He'll never sign. He has no honor. And Gina Haspel. Well, I don't know about her either. After that stuff with Abu Ghraib and the, uh, the various uh, black sites, I'm afraid not. So what we've got, no parade. Instead, Admiral McRaven, backed up by General Hurtling, who was a person of importance in his own right. I'm, I think there may be more coming on that. I sure hope so. No parade. The McRaven statement may be um, very popular. The 15 intelligence community bosses, going all the way back to Reagan. And then the 400 newspapers. And I think that is, that is a relatively powerful institutional uh, arrangement. So it's not um, conclusive, and we've got to realize that we need, uh, we're not going to have time here. C- come, come to our other program. Come to the American system this week. We're going to have uh, the story of Russian space weapons, uh, the Russian satellites, right? We put out uh, one of the leaders of the U.S. Uh, Space Command a couple of uh, weeks ago saying that the Russians and the Chinese will soon have formidable space weapons. You have to match that. This is not the time to negotiate a ban on weapons in space when they've got them and maybe you don't. You've got to negotiate, as we've always heard, from a position of strength, Don. Is that what you wanted, Don? From a position of strength, well, right now, you're a pathetic, weak patsy, right? You're a, you're a dumb uh, giant. So anyway, we're looking at this, uh, these Russian anti-satellite weapons, Cosmos 2521, Cosmos 2519, Cosmos 2499, the Kamikaze. These are anti-satellite weapons, GPS, communication satellites, all sorts of systems vulnerable to this, uh, we're watching photographs of the Chinese aircraft carrier cavorting around the Asian uh, littoral. So these are the threats. We also, we're going to have news on the Genoa Bridge collapse. This is amazing. The Grillini, right, the, the thing that is now two-thirds of the government. The Di Maio side of the government. They were warned four or five years ago that the bridge would come down, and their answer was a snarky evaluation saying, oh, stop telling us this fairy tale. Stop telling us this little fairy story about the imminent collapse of the Morandi Bridge on the Autostrada Genoa West. And uh, (laughs) there was a movement called No Gronda. No Gronda was... Don't build the bypass. And the beginnings of this Grillo, this modern Diogenes, this scurrilous bum and clochard, this guy, or Barbone, Barbone, right, clochard, uh, the No Granda were one of the original components of the Grillo party. So there were two groups. There was the No Bypass, and then there was the That's where they come from. So these people now have blood on their responsibility. Right? They, uh, they could have saved the 35, 40 people who had perished, and we think a whole lot more. And uh, that's what they're going to have to live with. So it's time for these people to, uh, to go into exile, as Cicero would have, uh, would have said. So we'll see you on Monday on World, uh, I'm sorry, Monday on American System, americansystem.tv, americansystem.tv, and otherwise back here next week.